So let's just yeah, let's start by reviewing kind of what we've learned about optimizing multi-layer functions with SGD. And so the idea is that we've got some data, and then we do something to that data. For example, we multiply it by a weight matrix, and then we do something to that. For example, we put it through a softmax or a sigmoid. And then we do something to that, such as do a cross-entropy loss or a root mean squared error loss. Okay, and that's going to like give us some scalar. Oh. So this is going to have no hidden layers. This has got a linear layer, uh, a nonlinear activation being a soft max, and a loss function being a root mean squared error or a cross entropy. All right, and then we've got our input data. Input linear. Nonlinear plus. So, for example, if this was um, sigmoid or um, or softmax, and this was cross entropy, then that would be logistic regression. Um, so it's still a uh, yeah. Cross entropy, yeah. Let's do that next. Sure. Um, for now, think of it like think of root mean squared error. Same thing. Some loss function. Okay. For now, um, we'll, we'll look at cross entropy again in a moment. Um, so, how do we calculate the derivative of that with um, with respect to our weights? Right. So, really, it would probably be better if we said x comma w here because it's really a function of the weights as well and so we want the derivative of this with respect to our weights oh, sorry I put it in the wrong spot uh, uh, G f of x comma w <laughs> I just screwed up that's all that's why that didn't make sense all right um, So to do that, we just basically we do the chain rule. So we just say that this is equal to h of u, and u equals uh, g f. Well, g, u equals g of v, and v equals f of x. So we can just rewrite it like that. Right, and then we can do the, the chain rule, so we can say that's equal to h dash. The derivative is h dash u by g dash v by f dash x. Happy with all that so far? Okay. So um, uh, in order to take the derivative with respect to the weights, therefore uh, we just have to calculate that derivative with respect to w using that exact formula. So if we had in there um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so so d of all that dw would be that. Yeah. Um, so then if if we, you know, went further here and had like um, Another linear layer, right? Let's give us a bit more room. Another linear layer, I comma um, I don't know, w two, right? So we now got another linear layer. There's no difference to now calculate the derivative with respect to all of the parameters. We can still use the exact same chain rule, right? So, so don't think of the multi-layer network as being like things that occur at different times. It's just a composition of functions, and so we just use the chain rule to calculate all the derivatives at once. You know, 
there's a, they're just a set of parameters that happen to appear in different parts of the function, but the, the, the calculus is no, no different. So to calculate this with respect to w1 and w2, you know, it's, it's just, you just increase, you know, w, you can just now just call it w and say w1 is, is, is all of those weights. So the result, ah, that's a great question. So what you're going to have then is um, uh, a list of parameters, right? So here's W1, and like it's 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 probably some kind of higher rank tensor, you know. Like if it's a convolutional layer, um, it'll you know be like a rank three tensor or whatever, but we can flatten it out, right? We'll just make it a list of parameters. Um, there's W1. Here's W2, right? It's just another list of parameters, right? And here's our loss, which is a single, you know, a single number. So therefore, our derivative is just a vector of that same length, right? It's how much does changing that value of W affect the loss? How much does changing that value of W affect the loss, right? So you can basically think of it as a function like, you know, y equals ax1 plus bx2 plus c, right? And say like, oh, what's the derivative of that with respect to a, b, and c? And you would have three numbers, the derivative with respect to a, and b, and c. And that's all this is, right? It's the derivative with respect to that weight, and 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 that weight. And that weight. Um, to get there, inside the chain rule, um, we had to calculate, uh, and I'm not going to go into detail here, but we had to calculate um, like Jacobians. So, like the derivative uh, when you take a, a matrix product is you've now got something where you've got like a a weight matrix, and you've got an input vector. These are the activations from the previous layer. Right, and you've got um, some new output activations, right? And so now you've got to say, like, okay, for this particular, sorry, for this particular um, weight, um, how does changing this particular weight change this particular output? And how does changing this particular weight change this particular output? And so forth. So you kind of end up with these higher dimensional tensors showing, like, for every weight, how does it affect every output, right? Um, but then by the time you get to the loss function, the loss function is going to have like a mean or a sum or a something. So they're all going to get added up in the end. You know? And so this kind of thing, like, I don't know, it drives me a bit crazy to try and calculate it out by hand or even think of it step by step because you tend to have like You just have to remember for every input in a layer for every output in the next layer You know you're going to have to to, to count for every weight for every output. You're going to have to have a separate gradient um, One good way to look at this is to learn to use PyTorch's like dot grad Attribute and dot backward method manually uh, and like look up the tutorial the PyTorch tutorials And so you can actually start setting up some calculations with a vector input and a vector output and then type dot backward and then say type dot grad and like Look at it right and then do some really small ones with just two or three Items in the input and output vectors and like make the make the operation like plus two or something and like See what the shapes are make sure it makes sense Um, yeah, because it's kind of like a, this a vector matrix calculus is not like introduces zero new concepts to anything you learned in high school, like strictly speaking. But getting a feel for how these shapes move around, I find took a lot of practice. You know, um, the good news is you almost never have to worry about it. Um, okay, so We were talking about um, 
then using this kind of logistic regression um, for NLP. Uh, and before we got to that point, we were talking about using um, naive Bayes for NLP. And the basic idea was that we could take a document, right, a review, like this movie is good, and turn it into a bag of words representation consisting of the number of times each word appears, right? And we call this the vocabulary. This is the unique list of words. Okay, um, and we used the um, SK Learn count vectorizer to automatically generate both the vocabulary, which in SK Learn they call they call the features, uh, and to call, create the bag of words representations, and the whole group of them then is called a, a term document matrix. Okay, um, and we kind of realized that we could calculate the probability that um, a positive review contains the word this by just averaging the number of times this appears in the positive reviews, and we could do the same for the oops, and we could do the same for the negatives, right? And then we could take the ratio of them to get something which, if it's greater than one, Uh, was uh, a, a word that appeared more often in the positive reviews or less than one was a word that appeared more often in the negative reviews okay um, and then uh, we realized you know using using Bayes rule that we, uh, and taking the logs um, that we could basically end up with something where we could add up the logs of these um, plus the log of the ratio of, of the probabilities that things are in class one versus class zero Um, and end up with something we can compare to zero. Uh, if it's greater than zero, then we can predict a document is positive, or if it's less than zero, we can predict the document is negative. And that was our Bayes rule. Right? Um, so we kind of did that from math first principles, and I think we agreed that the, the naive in naive Bayes was a, a good description, because uh, it, 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 it assumes independence when it's definitely not true. Um, but it was an interesting starting point, and I think it was interesting to observe when we actually got to the point where like okay now we've you know calculated the the ratio of the probabilities um, and took, took the log and now rather than multiplying them together of course we have to add them up and when when we actually wrote that down we realized like oh that is you know just a standard uh, um, weight matrix product plus a bias right and so then we kind of realized like oh okay so like if this is not very good uh, accuracy 80% accuracy um, why not improve it by saying hey we know other ways to calculate a co you know a bunch of coefficients and a bunch of biases which is to learn them in a logistic regression Right? So in other words, this this is the formula we use for a logistic regression um, And so why don't we just create a logistic regression and fit it? Okay, and it's going to be Give us the same thing, but rather than coefficients and biases which are theoretically correct based on You know this assumption of independence and based on Bayes rule there'll be the coefficients and biases that Are actually the best in this data, right? So that was kind of where we got to, and so the kind of key insight here is like just about everything I find in machine learning ends up being either like a tree or you know a bunch of matrix products and nonlinearities, right? Like it, it, everything seems to end up kind of coming down to the same thing, uh, including, as it turns out, Bayes' rule. Right? And then it turns out that nearly all of the time, then whatever the parameters are in that function, nearly all of the time it turns out that they're better learnt than calculated based on theory. Right? And indeed that's what happened when we actually tried learning those coefficients, we got, you know, 85%. Okay. So then um, we noticed that we could also rather than take the whole term document matrix we could instead just take them the you know ones and zeros for presence or absence of a word um, 
and you know sometimes it was you know this equally as good um, um, but then we actually tried something else which is we tried adding regularization and with regularization the binarized approach turned out to be a little better right so then regularization was where we took the loss function right, and again let's start with RMSC and then we'll talk about cross entropy uh, loss function was our predictions minus our actuals sum that up take the average plus a penalty okay and so this specifically is is the L2 penalty uh, if this instead was the absolute value of W uh, then that would be the L1 penalty okay um, We also noted that we don't really care about the loss function per se. We only care about its derivative. That's actually the thing that updates the weights. Um, so we can, because this is a sum, we can take the derivative of each part separately. And so the derivative of this part was just that, right? And so we kind of learnt that even though these are mathematically equivalent, they have different names. Uh, this version is called weight decay, and is kind of what's used. That term is used in the neural net literature. Okay. Um, so cross entropy, on the other hand, um, you know, it's just another loss function like root mean squared error. Um, but it's specifically designed for classification, right? Um, and so here's an example of, of a binary cross entropy. So let's say this is our, you know, is it a cat or a dog? So let's just say is cat one or a zero. So it's cat, cat, dog, dog, cat. And these are our predictions. This is the output of our final layer of our neural net or our logistic regression or whatever. All right? Then all we do is we say, okay, let's take. The, uh, the actual times the log of the prediction and then we add to that 1 minus actual times the log of 1 minus the prediction and then take the negative of that whole thing all right so I suggested to uh, to you all that you tried to kind of write the if statement version of this so hopefully you've done that by now otherwise I'm about to spoil it for you so this was why times log y plus 1 minus y times log 1 minus y right and negative of that okay so who wants to tell me how to write this as an if statement all right Chen Shi hit me I'll give it a try so yes, sir. if y equal to Sorry, if y equal to 1, mm -hmm. then return log y. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, well, um, mm -hmm. else return log 1 minus 1. Good. Oh, that's the thing in the brackets, and you take the minus of it. Good. So the key insight Chen Shi's using is that y has two possibilities, 1 or 0. Okay? And so very often the math can hide. The key insight, which I think happens here until you actually think about what the values it can take, uh, right? So that's that's all it's doing. It's saying either give me that or give me that, right? Uh, could you pass that to the back, please, Jin Shi? Sorry if I'm missing something, but do you not need two variables in that statement? Because you got y. Shouldn't it be like y hat and a y or something? Oh yeah, thank you. As usual, it's me missing something. Okay. Okay, and so then the you know the multi-category version is just the same thing, but you're saying you know it for different more than just y equals one or zero, but y equals zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, for instance. Okay. Um, and so that uh, you know that loss function has a well, you can figure it out yourself, and particularly simple derivative um, and it also you know another thing you could play with at home if you like is like thinking about how 
the derivative looks when you add a sigmoid or a softmax before it. You know, it turns out it all turns out very nicely because you've got an XB thing going into a loggy thing, so you end up with you know very well behaved derivatives. The reason, I guess, there's lots of reasons that people use RMSE for regression and cross entropy for classification, but most of it comes back to st uh, this statistical idea of a best linear unbiased estimator, you know, and based on the likelihood function, it kind of turns out that these have some nice statistical properties. Um, it turns out, however, in practice, uh, root mean squared error in particular, the properties are perhaps more theoretical than actual, and actually nowadays using the um, uh, the absolute deviation rather than the sum of squares deviation can often work better. Um, so in practice, like everything in machine learning, I normally try both. For a particular data set, I'll try both loss functions and see which one works better. Unless, of course, it's a Kaggle competition, in which case you're told how Kaggle's going to judge it, and you should use the same loss function as Kaggle's evaluation metric. All right. So yeah, so this is really the key insight is like hey, let's let's not use theory But instead learn things from the data and you know, we hope that we're going to get better results um, Particularly with regularization we do and then I think the key regularization insight here is hey Let's not like try to reduce the number of parameters in our model But instead like use lots of parameters and then use regularization to figure out um, Which ones are actually useful? Right? And so then we took that a step further by saying hey given we can do that with regularization Let's create lots more features by adding bigrams and trigrams You know bigrams like by vast and by vengeance and trigrams like by vengeance full stop and by Vera miles right? um, And you know just to keep things a little faster we limited it to 800,000 features But you know even with the full 70 million features it, it works just as well and it's not a hell of a lot slower Uh, so we created a term document matrix uh, again um, using the full set of n-grams for the training set the validation set um, and So now we can go ahead and say okay our labels is the training set labels as before our independent variables is the um, binarized term document matrix as before um, and then let's fit a uh, logistic regression to that um, And do some predictions and we get uh, 90% accuracy. So this is looking pretty good Okay um, So the logistic regression Let's go back to our naive Bayes, right in our naive Bayes We have this term document matrix and then for every feature we're calculating The probability of that feature occurring if it's class one, that probability of that feature occurring if it's class two, and then the ratio of those two, right? And um, in the paper that we're actually basing this off, they call this P, this Q, and this R, right? Maybe I should just fill that in. P, Q, and maybe then we'll say probability to make it more obvious. Okay, um, and so then we kind of said, hey, let's let's not use these ratios as the coefficients in that um, in that matrix multiply, but let's instead like try and learn some coefficients. You know, so maybe start out with some random numbers. You know, and then try and use uh, stochastic gradient descent to find slightly better ones. So you'll notice, you know, some important features here. The the R um, vector is a vector of rank one, and its length is equal to the number of features. And of course, our logistic regression coefficient matrix is also of length one, uh, sorry, rank one, and length equal to the number of features, right? And we're, you know, we're saying like they're kind of two ways of calculating the same kind of thing. Right, one based on theory, one based on data. So here is like some of the numbers in R. Right, remember it's using the log. So these numbers, which are less than zero, uh, represent things which are 
um, more likely to be negative, and these ones here are more likely, sorry, this one here is more likely to be positive. And so here's e to the power of that, and so these are the ones we can compare to 1 rather than to 0. So I'm going to do something that hopefully is going to seem weird. Um, and so first of all, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to say what we're going to do, and then I'm going to try and describe why it's weird, and then we'll talk about why it may not be as weird as we first thought. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our term document matrix, and we're going to multiply it by R. So what that means is we're going to, well, we can do it here in Excel, right? So we're going to say, let's grab everything in our term document matrix and multiply it by the equivalent value in the vector of R. Right? So this is like a, a broadcasted element-wise multiplication, not a matrix multiplication. Okay. And that's what that does. Okay, so here is the value of the term document matrix times R. In other words, everywhere that a zero appears there, a zero appears here, and every time a one appears here, the equivalent value of R appears here. So we haven't really um, we haven't really changed much, right? We've just we've just kind of Changed the ones into something else into, into the into the R's from that feature right? and so what we're now going to do is we're going to use this as our independent variables instead in our logistic regression Okay, so here we are multiply x x n b x naive Bayes version is x times r and now let's do a logistic regression fitting using those independent variables and let's then um, do that for the validation set, okay, and get the predictions. And lo and behold, we have a better number. Okay, so let me explain why this hopefully seems surprising. Um, given that we're just multiplying. Oh, I picked out the wrong ones. I should have said R, not coef. Okay, that's actually R. I got the wrong number. Okay, um, so that's our independent variables, right? And then the, the logistic regression has come up with some set of coefficients. Let's pretend for a moment that these are the coefficients that it happened to come up with, right? Um, we could now say, well, let's not use this um, set, let's not use this um, set of independent variables, but let's use the original binarized feature matrix, right? And then divide all of our coefficients by the values in R, and we're going to get exactly the same result mathematically. So, um, you know, we've got um, our. Um, X naive Bayes version of the independent variables, and we've got some uh, some set of weights, some well, some set of coefficients. I call it W, right? Um, w one, let's say, where it's found like this is a good set of coefficients for making our predictions from, right? But X and B is simply equal to X times, as in element-wise, times R, right? So in other words, this is equal to x times R times the weights. And so like we could just change the weights to be that, right, and get the same number. So this ought to mean that the change that we made to the dependent variable shouldn't have made any difference Because we can calculate exactly the same thing without making that change So there's the question Why did it make a difference? 
So in order to answer this question, I'm going to try and get you all to try and think about this. In order to answer this question, you need to think about, like, okay, what are the things that aren't mathematically the same? Why is, why is it not identical? What are the reasons? Like, come up with some hypotheses. What are some reasons that maybe we've actually ended up with a better answer? And to figure that out, we need to first of all start with, like, well, why is it even a different answer? Why is that different to that? This is subtle. All right, what do you think? I was just wondering if it was two different kinds of multiplications. You said that one is the element-wise multiplication. Is no, they, 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 they do end up mathematically being the same. Okay. Um, pretty much. There's a minor wrinkle, but not, but it's not that. It's not some order operations thing. Worth a try. Chenchi? You are on a roll today, so let's see how you go. I feel like the features are less correlated to each other. I mean, like, I've, I've made a claim that these are mathematically equivalent, so right. So what are you saying really, you know, why, why are we getting different answers? It's good, keep on coming up with hypotheses, we need lots of wrong answers before we start finding it's the right ones. It's like that, you know, warmer, hotter, colder, you know. Uh, Ernest, are you going to get us hotter? Does it have anything to do with the regularization? Uh, yes. And is it the fact that when you... So let's start there, right? So okay. Ernest's point here is like, okay, Jeremy, you've said they're equivalent, but they're equivalent outcomes, right? But you got through, you went through a process to get there, and that process included regularization, and they're not necessarily equivalent regularization. Like, our loss function has a penalty. So yeah, help us think through, Ernest, how much that might impact things. Well, this is me being kind of dumb, but I'm just noticing that the numbers are bigger in the ones that have been weighted by the, the naive phase mm -hmm. um, uh, R weights. And so... For These are bigger. And some are smaller, some are bigger. Right, yeah. but the, the, there are like some the, bigger ones. Like the variance between the columns is, is much higher now. The variance is bigger. Yeah. I think that's a very interesting insight. Okay. That's all I got. <laughs> okay. So build on that. Prince has been on a roll all month, so uh, hit us. What actually, I'm not sure, but That's fine. is it also consi uh, like considering the dependency of different words, is that why it is performing better, rather than all words independent of each other? Not really. I mean, it's it's you know again theoret you know theoretically these are creating mathematically equivalent outputs, so they're not they're not doing something different except, as Ernest mentioned. They're getting impacted differently by regularization. So what's so what's regularization, right? Regularization is we start out with our. Um, that was the weirdest thing. I forgot to go into screenwriting mode, and it just turns out that you can actually write in Excel, and I had no idea that was true. <laughs> I still use screenwriting mode, so I don't kill up my uh, spreadsheet. <laughs> I just I never tried. Um, so our loss was equal to like our our cross entropy loss, you know, um, based on the um, predictions um, or the predictions and the actuals, right? Plus our penalty. So if your if your weights are large. Right, then that piece gets bigger, right, and it drowns out that piece, right. But that's actually the piece we care about, right. We actually want it to be a good fit, so we want to have as little regularization going on as we can get away with. We want, so we want to have less weights. So here's the thing, right? Our value, uh, yes. Can you pass it over here? When you say less weights, did you mean lesser weights? I do, yeah, yeah. And I kind of use the, the two words a little equivalently, which is not quite fair, I agree, but the idea is that weights that are pretty close to zero are kind of not there. Yeah. Um, so here's the thing, our values of R, you know, and I'm not a Bayesian weenie, but I'm still going to use the word prior, right? They're kind of like a prior. So like, we think that the the different 
levels of importance and positive or negative of these different features might be something like that, right? We think that like bad, you know, might be uh, more correlated with negative than than good, right? So our kind of implicit assumption um, be before was that we have no priors. So in other words, when we said squared weights, we're saying a non-zero weight is something we don't want to have, right? But actually, I think what I really want to say is that Differing from the naive Bayes expectation is something I don't want to do, right? Like only vary from the naive Bayes prior unless you have good reason to believe otherwise, right? And so that's actually what this ends up doing, right? We end up saying, you know what? We think this value is probably three, right? And so if you're going to like make it a lot bigger, or a lot smaller, right? That's going to create the kind of variation in weights that's going to cause that squared term to go up, right? So, so if you can, you know, just leave all these values about similar to where they are now, right? And so that's what the penalty term is now doing, right? The penalty term, when our inputs is already multiplied by R, is saying penalize things where we're varying it from our naive Bayes prior. Can you pass that there? Uh, why multiply only with the R, not uh, constant like R square or something like that, when the variance would be much higher this time? Because our, um, our prior comes from an actual theoretical model, right? So I said, like, I don't like to rely on theory, But I have, if I have some theory, then you know maybe we should use that as our starting point rather than starting off by assuming everything's equal. So our, our prior said, hey, we've got this model called naive Bayes, and the naive Bayes model said, if the naive Bayes assumptions were correct, then R is the correct coefficient, right? In this specific formulation, that that's why we pick that because our Our prior is based on that that theory. Okay, so this is a really interesting insight which I never really see covered, which is this idea is that we can use these like, you know, traditional machine learning techniques. We can imbue them with this kind of Bayesian sense by by starting out. You know, incorporating our theoretical expectations into the data that we give our model, right? And when we do so, that then means we don't have to regularize as much, and that's good, right? Because if we regularize a lot, right, let's try it. Let's go back to, you know, here's our. Remember, um, the, the, the way they do it in the SKLearn logistic regression is this is the reciprocal of the amount of um, regularization penalty. So we'll kind of um, add lots of regularization by making it small. So that like really hurts. That really hurts our accuracy because now It's trying really hard to get those weights down. The loss function is overwhelmed by the need to reduce the weights, and the need to make it predictive is kind of now seems t totally unimportant, right? So, um, so by kind of starting out and saying, you know what, don't push the weights down so that you end up ignoring the the terms. But instead, push them down so that you try to get rid of, you know, ignore differences from our expectation based on the naive Bayes formulation. Um, so that um, ends up giving us uh, a very nice result, which actually was originally this this technique was originally presented, uh, I think, about 2012. Um, Chris Manning, who's a terrific NLP researcher up at Stanford, 
and uh, Cedar Wang, who I don't know, but I assume is awesome because his paper is awesome, they basically came up with this, with this idea. Um, and what they did was they compared it to a number of other approaches on a number of other data sets. So one of the things they tried is this one, is the IMDB data set. Right? And so here's Naive Bayes SVM on bigrams, and as you can see, this approach outperformed the other linear-based approaches that they looked at, and also some um, restricted Boltzmann machine kind of neural net-based approaches they looked at. Now, nowadays, there are better ways. There are, you know, there are better ways to do this. And in fact, in the deep learning course, we showed a new state-of-the-art result that we just developed at FastAI that gets um, well over 94%. Um, but still, you know, like particularly for a linear technique that's easy, fast, and intuitive, this is pretty good. And you'll notice when they when they did this, they only used bigrams, and I assume that's because they I looked at their code and it was kind of pretty slow and ugly. Um, you know, I figured out a way to optimize it a lot more, as you saw, and so we were able to use um, uh, here uh, trigrams, and so we get quite a lot better. So we got 91.8 versus the 91.2. But other than that, it's identical. Um, also, I mean, they used a support vector machine, which is almost identical to a, a logistic regression in this case. Um, so th there's some minor differences, right? So um, I think that's a pretty cool result, and you know, I will mention. You know, what you get to see here in class is the result of like many weeks and often many months of research that I do. And so I don't want you to think like this stuff is obvious. It's not at all. Like reading this paper, um, there's no description in the paper of like why they use this model, how it's different, why they thought it works. You know, it took me a week or two to even realize that it's kind of like mathematically equivalent to a normal logistic regression, and then a few more weeks to realize that the difference is actually in the regularization. Um, you know, like this is kind of like machine learning, as I'm sure you've noticed from the Kaggle competitions you enter, you know, like you come up with a thousand good ideas, 999 of them, no matter how confident you are, they're going to be great, they always turn out to be shit, you know, and then finally after four weeks, one of them finally works and kind of gives you the <laughs> enthusiasm to spend another four weeks of misery and frustration. Um, this is the norm, right? And, and like, For sure, the, the, the best um, practitioners I know in machine learning all share one particular trait in common, which is they're very, very tenacious, you know, also known as stubborn and bloody-minded, right, which is definitely a reputation I seem to have, um, probably fair, um, uh, along with uh, another thing which is that they're all re very good coders, you know, they're very good at turning their ideas into, into code. Um, so, yeah, um, so, you know, this was like a really interesting experience for me working through this a few months ago to try and like figure out how to, how to at least, you know, how to explain why this at the, at the time kind of state-of-the-art result exists. And so once I figured that out, I was actually able to build on top of it and make it quite a bit better. Um, and I'll show you what I did. And uh, this is where it was very, very handy to have PyTorch at my disposal, um, because I was able to kind of create something that was uh, customized just the way that I want it to be, um, and also very fast by using the GPU. Um, so here's the kind of fast AI version of, of the NB SVM. Actually, my friend Stephen Merity, who's a terrific um, researcher in uh, NLP, has christened this the NBSVM++, which I thought was lovely. So here is the, even though there is no SVM, it's a logistic regression, but as I said, nearly exactly the same thing. Um, so let me first of all show you like the code. Um, so this is like, we try to like, once I figure out like, okay, this is like the best way I can come up with to do a linear bag of words model, I kind of embed it into fast AI so you can just write a couple of lines of code. So the code is basically, hey, I want to create a uh, data class for text classification. I want to create it from a bag of words. Right? Here is my bag of words. Here are my labels. Here is the same thing for the validation set. Um, and use up to 2,000 
unique words per review, right? which is plenty. Um, um, so then from that model data, construct a, a learner, which is kind of the, the fast AI generalization of a model, um, which is uh, based on a dot product of naive Bayes, and then fit that model, um, and then do a few epochs, and after five epochs I was already up to 92.2. Right? So this is now like, you know, getting quite well above um, this, this linear baseline. Um, so let me show you the code for, for that. Um, so the code is like horrifyingly short. That's it. Right? And it, it'll also look on the whole extremely familiar. Right? There's a, there's a few tweaks here. Um, pretend this thing that says embedding, pretend it actually says linear. Okay, I'm going to show you embedding in a moment. Pretend it says linear. So we've got basically a linear layer where the number of features coming with uh, the number of features as the rows. And remember, SK learn features means number of words, basically. And then for each row, we're going to create one weight, which makes sense, right? For like a logistic regression, every every uh, so not for each row, for each word. Each word has one weight. Um, and then uh, we're going to be multiplying it by the the R values. So for each word, we have one R value per class. So I actually made this so this can handle like not just positive versus negative, but maybe figuring out like which author created this work. There could be five or six authors, whatever, right? And basically, uh, we kind of use those linear layers um, to to get the um, the value of the weight and the value of the R, and then we take the weight times the R and then sum it up, and so that's just a dot product, okay? Um, so just a, uh, just a simple dot product, just as we would do for any logistic regression, um, and then do the softmax. So the very minor tweak um, that we add to get the, the better result is this the main one really is this here this plus something right? And the thing I'm adding is It's a parameter, but I pretty much always use this this version this value 0.4 So what does this do? So what this is doing is it's again kind of changing the prior right so if you think about it Even once we use this R times the term document matrix as their independent variables You really want to start with a question. Okay, the penalty terms are still pushing W down to zero Right, so what did it mean? For W to be zero right so what would it mean if we had you know Coefficient zero 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 Right so what that would do when we go okay this matrix times these coefficients We still get zero Right so a weight of zero still ends up saying I have no opinion on whether this thing is positive or negative On the other hand if they were all one Right then it's basically says my opinion is that the naive Bayes coefficients are exactly right Okay, and so the idea is that I said Zero is almost certainly not the right prior, right? We shouldn't really be saying if there's no coefficient, it means ignore the naive phase coefficient. Um, one is probably too high, right? Because we actually think that naive phase is only kind of part of the answer, right? And so I played around with a few different data sets where I basically said take the weights and add to them some constant right and so zero would become in this case 0.4 right so in other words the um, the regularization penalty is pushing the weights not towards zero but towards this value right and I found that across a number of data sets 0.4 works pretty well right and it's pretty resilient right so again, this is the basic idea 
is to kind of like get the best of both worlds. You know, we're 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 learning from the data using a simple model, but we're incorporating, you know, our prior knowledge as best as we can. And so it turns out when you say, okay, let's let's tell it, you know, a, a weight matrix of zeros actually means that you should use about, you know, about half of the R values. Um, that ends up that ends up working better than the prior that the the weights should all be zero. Um, yes. Is the uh, the weights the W? Is it that uh, the point for uh, the m amount of regularization required? The the the, the amount of uh, so we have this uh, term where the we have the term where uh, we reduce the amount of error, the prediction error, RMSE, plus we have the regularization. And is a W the point for denote the amount of regularization required? So W are the weights, okay. right? So this is calculating our activations. Okay, so we calculate our activations as being equal to the weights um, times the R sum, right? So that's just our normal, um, our, our, our normal linear function, right? So, so the um, the thing which is being penalized is my weight matrix. That's what gets penalized. So by saying, hey, you know what? Don't just use W. Use W plus 0.4. So that's not being penalized. It's not part of the weight matrix. Okay. So effectively, the weight matrix gets 0.4 for free. Okay. Yeah. So by doing this, uh, even after regularization, then every uh, observe uh, every feature is getting some form of weight, right? Some form of minimum weight or something like that. Um, not necessarily, because it could end up choosing a coefficient of negative 0.4 for a feature, oh, okay. and so that would say, um, you know what? Even though naive Bayes says it's the R should be whatever for this feature, I think you should totally ignore it. Yeah. Great questions. Okay. Uh, we started at 20 past two. Okay, let's take a break uh, for about eight minutes or so and start back about 25 to four. Okay, so a um, couple of questions at the break. Um, the first was just for a kind of Reminder or a bit of a summary as to what's going on here, right? And so here we have W plus I'm writing it out. Yeah plus Adjusted weight a weight adjustment times R, Right so so normally what we were doing um so normally what we are doing is saying, hey, logistic regression is basically um, Wx, right? I'm going to ignore the bias, okay? And then we were changing it to be W dot R times X, right? And then we were kind of saying, let's do that bit first, right? Um, uh, although in this particular case, actually, now I look at it, I'm doing it in this code, it doesn't matter obviously, in this code I'm actually doing I'm doing this bit first. Um, and so um, so this thing here actually, I, I called it W, which is probably pretty bad, it's actually W times X. Right? So so instead of W times X times R, I've got W times X plus a constant times R, right? So the, the key idea here is that regularization Can't draw in yellow. That's fair enough. 
regularization wants the weights to be zero, right? Because we're trying to, it's trying to reduce that. Okay. And so what we're saying is like, okay, we want to push the weights towards zero because we're saying like that's our like default starting point expectation is the weights are zero. And so we want to be in a situation where if the weights are zero, then we have a model that like makes theoretical or intuitive sense to us, right? This model, if the weights are zero, doesn't make intuitive sense to us, right? Because it's saying, hey, multiply everything by zero, gets rid of all of that, and gets rid of that as well. And we were actually saying, no, we actually think R, R is useful. We actually want to keep that, right? So, so instead, we say, you know what? Let's take that piece here and add 0.4 to it, right? So now, if the regularizer is pushing the weights towards zero, then it's pushing the value of this sum towards 0.4, right? And so therefore it's pushing our whole model to 0.4 times r, right? So in other words, our kind of default starting point, if you've regularized all the weights out altogether, is to say, yeah, you know, let's use a bit of r, that's probably a good idea. Okay. Um, so that's the idea, right? That's the idea. Is basically, you know, what happens when when that's zero, right? And you and you want that to like be something sensible, because otherwise, regularizing the weights to move in that direction wouldn't be such a good idea. Okay. Second question was about um, um, n-grams. So the n in n-gram can be uni, bi, tri, whatever, one, two, three, whatever grams. So for the, this movie is good, right? It has four unigrams. This movie is good. It has three bigrams. This movie, movie is, is good. It has two trigrams. This movie is movie is good. Okay? Uh, can you pass that? So, yeah, so, do you mind go back to the uh, WADJ stuff, the 0 0.4 stuff? Yeah. So I was wondering if this um, adjustment will harm the predictability of the model? Because um, think of extre extreme case if it's not 0 0.4, if it's 4,000. And or all right. coefficients will be like right. essentially so. So exactly. So so our prior needs to make sense, and so our prior here, and you know this is why it's called dot prior nb is our prior is that this is something where we think naive Bayes is a good prior, right? And so naive Bayes says that r equals p over. That's not how you write p. P over q. I have not had much sleep. Um, P over Q is a good prior. And not only do we think it's a good prior, but we think R um, times X plus B is a good model. That's, that's the naive base model. So in other words, we expect that, you know, a coefficient of one is a good coefficient, not, not 4,000. Right? So we think specifically we don't think we think zero is probably not a good coefficient Right, but we also think that maybe The naive Bayes version is a little overconfident. So maybe one's a little high So we're pretty sure that the right number assuming that our, our model our naive Bayes model is appropriate is between <coughs> zero and one uh, no, but oh, what I was thinking is as long as it's not zero, you are pushing those uh, coefficients that are supposed to be zero to something not zero and make the like high coefficients less distinctive from the low coefficients. Well, but you see, I, they're not supposed to be zero. They're supposed to be R. Like that's that's what they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be R, right? And so. 
Um, and remember, this is inside our forward function, so this is part of what we're taking the gradient of, right? So it's basically saying, okay, we're still gonna, you know, you can still set self.w to anything you like, um, but just the regularizer wants it to be zero. And so all we're saying is, okay, if, if you want it to be zero, then I'll try to make zero be, you know, give a sensible answer. Right, that's the basic idea. And like, yeah, nothing says point four is perfect for every data set. I've tried a few different data sets and found various numbers between point three and point six that are optimal, but I've never found one where point four is less good than zero, which is not surprising. And I've also never found one where one is better. Right? So the idea is like this is a reasonable default, but it's another parameter you can play with, which I kind of like, right? It's another thing you could use uh, grid search or whatever to figure out for your data set what's best. And you know, really the key here being um, every model before this one, as far as I know, has implicitly assumed it should be zero, because they just they don't have this parameter, right? And you know, by the way, I've actually got a second parameter here as well. Which is the same thing I do to R is actually divide R by a parameter, um, which I'm not going to worry too much about it now. But again, it's it's, a, it's another parameter you can use to kind of adjust what the nature of the regularization is. Um, you know, and I mean in the end, I'm I'm a empiricist, not a theoretician. You know, I thought this seemed like a good idea. Nearly all of my things that seem like a good idea turn out to be stupid. Um, this particular one gave good results. You know, on this data set and a few other ones as well. Um, okay, could you pass that? Oh, you want to start there? Yeah. Okay, I, I'm still a little bit confused about the W plus W adjusted thing. Uh huh. Uh, so you mentioned that we do W plus W adjusted so that uh, the coefficients don't get set to zero, uh, that we place some importance on the priors. But you also said that the 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 effect of learning can be that. W gets set to a negative value, which effectively mm -hmm. turns W plus W mm -hmm. to right. zero. So if if we are we are allowing the learning process to indeed set the priors to zero, the, the, the not the priors, the coefficients. Yep. So why is that in any way different from just having W? Because yeah, great question. Because of regularization, because we're penalizing it by that, right? So in other words. We're saying, you know what? If you, if the best thing to do is to ignore the value of R, that'll cost you. You're going to have to set W to a negative number, right? So only do that if that's clearly a good idea. Unless it's clearly a good idea, then you should leave, leave it where it is. That's that's the only reason. Like all of this stuff we've done today is basically entirely about. You know, maximizing the advantage we get from regularization and saying regularization pushes us towards some default assumption, and nearly all of the machine learning literature assumes that default assumption is everything zero. And I'm saying, like, it turns out, you know, it makes sense theoretically and turns out empirically that actually you should decide what your default assumption is, and that'll give you better results. So would it be right to say that, uh, in a way, you're Putting an additional hurdle in the uh, along the way towards getting all coefficients to zero, so it will be able to do that if it is really worth it. Yeah, exactly. So I'd say like the default hurdle without this is is making a coefficient non-zero is the hurdle. And now I'm saying no, the co the, the the hurdle is making a coefficient not be equal to 0.4 r. Yeah, that's our prince. So uh, this is sum of uh, w square into c. Sum of into w some lambda or c penalty constant. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, times something. So, yeah. So the weight decay should also depend on the value of c. If it is very less, like if c is sorry, by c do you mean this? A. Yeah, a. Ah, okay. uh, yeah. yeah. So if a is point one, then the weights might not go towards zero. Yes. Then we might not need weight decay. So well, the, 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 whatever this value, I mean, if the if the value of this is zero, then there is no regularization, right? But if this value is higher than zero, then there is some penalty, right? And and presumably we've set it to non-zero because we're overfitting, so we want some penalty. And so if there is some penalty, 
then then my assertion is that we should penalize things that are different to our prior not that we should penalize things that are different to zero right? And our prior is that things should be you know around about equal to R Okay, let's move on. Um, thanks for the great questions. Um, I want to talk about um, Embedding uh, I said pretend it's linear and indeed we can pretend it's linear. Let me show you how much we can pretend it's linear as in nn dot linear create a linear layer here is our data matrix right here are our coefficients if we're doing the R version here are our coefficients R right so if we were to Put those into a column vector Like so right then we could do a matrix multiply of that By that Right and so we're going to end up with So here's our matrix Here's our vector Right so we're going to end up with 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 1 times 1 1 times 3 Right 0 times 1 0 times point 0.3 Right, and then the next one zero times one one times one so forth. Okay, so like that the matrix multiply You know of this independent um, Variable matrix by this coefficient matrix is going to give us an answer. Okay, so that's that is just a matrix multiply So the question is like okay. Well, why didn't Jeremy write an n dot linear? Why did Jeremy write an n dot embedding? And the reason is because if you recall we don't actually store it like this because this is actually of width 800,000 and of height 25,000 right so rather than storing it like this we actually store it as 0 1 2 3 right 1 2 3 4 0 1 2 5 1 2 4 5 Okay, I'll ignore the ones one. Yeah, oops That's actually how we store it right is this bag of words contains Which word indexes? Does that make sense? Okay, so that's like um, This is like a sparse way of of storing it right is just list out the indexes in each sentence So given that I want to now do that matrix multiply That I just showed you to create that same outcome Right, but I want to do it from this representation So if you think about it All this is actually doing is it saying a one hot, you know, this is basically one hot encoded Right, it's kind of like a dummy dummy matrix version. Does it have the word this does it have the word movie? Does it have the word is and so forth? So if we took the simple version of like does it have the word this one? Oh, 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 oh Right and we multiplied that by that Right then that's just going to return the first item That makes sense um, So in general a one hot encoded vector times a matrix is identical to To looking up that matrix to find the nth row in it Right, so this is identical to saying find the zero first second and fifth Coefficients Right, so they're they're the same. They're exactly the same thing and like it doesn't like in this case. I only have one coefficient per feature 
right? But actually the way I did this was um, to have um, uh, one coefficient per feature for each class, right? So in this case it's both positive and negative, uh, so I actually had kind of like an R positive and an R negative, so R negative would be just the opposite, right? Equals that divided by that. Right. Now in the binary case, obviously it's redundant to have both, but what if it was like, um, what's the author of this text? Is it uh, Jeremy or Savannah or Terence? Right? Now we've got three categories, we want three values of R. Right? So the nice thing is that in this sparse version, you know, you can just look up, you know, the zeroth and the first and the second and the fifth, right? And again, it's identical, mathematically identical, to multiplying by a one-hot encoded matrix. But when you have sparse inputs, it's obviously much, much more efficient. So this computational trick, which is mathematically identical to, not conceptually analogous to, mathematically identical to, multiplying by a one-hot encoded matrix is called an embedding, right? So I'm sure you've all heard, or most of you probably heard about embeddings, like word embeddings, word to vec or glove or whatever, and people love to make them sound like there's some amazing new complex neural net thing, right? They're not. Embedding means um, make a multiplication by a one-hot encoded matrix faster by replacing it with a simple array lookup. Okay, so that's why I said you can think of this as if it said self dot w equals nn dot linear and f plus one by one, right? Because it actually does the same thing, right? It actually is a matrix with those dimensions. This actually is a matrix with those dimensions, right? It's a linear layer, um, but it's expecting that the input we're going to give it is not actually a one-hot encoded matrix, but is actually a list of integers, right? the indexes for each word or for each item. So you can see that the forward function in FastAI automatically gets, for this learner, the feature indexes. right? So they come from the sparse matrix automatically. NumPy makes it very easy to just grab those uh, those indexes Okay, so we, in other words there we've got here. We've got uh, a list of Each word index of a of the 800,000 that are in this document and so then this here says Look up each of those in our embedding matrix, which has got 800,000 rows and return each thing that you find Okay um, so mathematically identical to multiplying by the one hot encoded matrix. Does that make sense? So that's all an embedding is. And so um, what that means is um, we can now handle building any kind of model, like a you know whatever kind of neural network where we have potentially very high cardinality categorical variables as our inputs. Um, uh, we can then just uh, turn them into a numeric code between zero and the number of levels. And then we can learn a, um, you know, a, uh, a linear layer from that as if we had one hot encoded it, without ever actually constructing the one hot encoded version. And without ever actually doing that matrix multiply, okay. Instead, we will just store the index version and simply do the array lookup, okay. And so the gradients that are flowing back, you know, basically in the one-hot encoded version, everything that was a zero has no gradient. So the gradients flowing back is just going to update the particular row of the embedding matrix that we used, okay. And so that's fundamentally important for NLP um, Just like here like you know, I wanted to create a PyTorch model that would implement this this ridiculously simple little equation right and um, To do it 
without this trick would have meant I was feeding in a 25,000 by 800 to 800,000 uh, element array um, Which would have been kind of crazy right and so this this trick allowed me to write you know You know I just replaced the word linear with embedding replace the thing that feeds the um, one hot encodings in with something that just feeds the indexes in um, and that was it that that it kept working and so this now trains um, you know in about a minute per epoch um, Okay So What we can now do is we can now take this idea and apply it not just to language but to anything right for example predicting the sales of items at a grocery uh, Yes, where's the we pass that? Just a quick question. So we are not actually looking up anything, right? We are just saying that now that array with the indices that is the representation. So the represent. Group. So we are doing a lookup, right? The representation that's being stored for the but for the bag of words is now not one 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 zero zero one, but zero one two five, right? And so then we actually have to do our our matrix product. Right, but rather than doing the matrix product we look up the zeroth thing and the first thing and the second thing and the fifth thing So that means we are still retaining the one hot encoded matrix No, we didn't there's no one hot encoded matrix used here. This here's the one hot encoded matrix, which is not currently highlighted We've currently highlighted the list of indexes and the list of Coefficients from the weight matrix. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're kind of going to go go a step further and saying like, let's not use a linear model at all. Let's use a multi-layer neural network, right? And let's have the input to that potentially be uh, include some categorical variables, right? And those categorical variables we will just have as Um, um, numeric indexes uh, And so the first layer for those won't be a normal linear layer. There'll be an embedding layer Which we know behaves exactly like uh, a linear layer mathematically uh, And so then our hope will be that we can now use this to create a neural network for any kind of data right and so There was a competition on Kaggle Uh, a few years ago uh, called Rossmann, which is a German grocery chain um, Where they asked to predict the sales of items in uh, in their stores Right and uh, that included a mixture of categorical and continuous variables and in this paper by Gore and Burkhan They described their third place winning entry um, Which was much simpler than the first place winning entry um, but nearly as good Uh, but much much simpler because they took advantage of this idea of what they call entity embeddings <clears throat> um, In the paper they they thought I think that they had invented this um, actually had been written before earlier by uh, Yoshio Bengio and his co-authors in another Kaggle competition, which was predicting taxi destinations um, Although I will say I feel like uh, Gore went a lot further in describing how this can be um, used in many other ways Um, and so we'll we'll talk about that uh, as well <clears throat> so the So this one um, is actually in the uh, is in the deep learning one repo. Okay DL one lesson three, okay Because um, we talk about some of the deep learning specific aspects in the deep learning course where else in this course we're going to be uh, talking mainly about the feature engineering Um, and we're also going to be talking about you know kind of this uh, this embedding idea um, So let's start with the data right so the data um, was you know store number one on the 31st of July 2015 uh, was open uh, They had a promotion going on it was a school holiday It was not a state holiday And they sold 5,263 items So That's the key 
data they provided. And so the goal is obviously to predict sales in a test set that has the same information without sales. Um, they also tell you that for each store, it's of some particular type, it sells some particular assortment of goods, its nearest competitor, competitor is some distance away, the competitor opened in September 2008, and there's some more information about promos, I don't know the details of what that means. Like in many Kaggle competitions, they let you download external data sets if you wish, as long as you share them with other competitors. Uh, so people, sh um, oh, they also told you what state each store is in, so people downloaded a list of the names of the different states of Germany, they downloaded a file for each state in Germany for each week, some kind of Google Trend data. I don't know what specific Google Trend they got, but there was that. Um, for each date, they downloaded a whole bunch of temperature information. Um, that's it. And then here's the test set. Okay. So, I mean, one interesting insight here is that the, the, there was probably a mistake in some ways for Rossman to design this competition as being one where you could use external data, because in reality, you don't actually get to find out next week's weather or next week's Google Trends, you know. Um, but, you know, when you're competing in Kaggle, you don't care about that, you just want to win, so you use whatever you can get. Um, so let's talk first of all about data cleaning. You know, the, the, there wasn't really much feature engineering done in this third place winning entry. Um, like by, by particularly by Kaggle standards, where normally every last thing counts, um, this is a great example of how far you can get with, with a neural net. Um, and it certainly reminds me of the claims prediction competition we talked about yesterday, where the winner did no feature engineering and entirely relied on deep learning. Um, <laughs> the laughter in the room, I guess, is from people who did a little bit more than no feature engineering uh, in that competition. Um, so, you know, I should mention, by the way, like, I find that bit where like you work hard at a competition and then it closes and you didn't win and the winner comes out and says, this is how I won, like that's the bit where you learn the most, right? Like sometimes that's happened to me and it's been like, oh, I thought of that, I thought I tried that, and then I go back and I realize I like had a bug there, I didn't test properly, and I learn like, oh, okay, like I really need to learn to like test this thing in this different way. Sometimes it's like, oh, I thought of that, but I assumed it wouldn't work. I've really got to remember to check everything before I make any assumptions. And you know, sometimes it's just like, oh, I, I did not think of that technique. Wow, now I know it's better than everything I just tried. Because like otherwise somebody says like, hey, you know, here's a really good technique. You're like, okay, great. Right? But when you spent months trying to do something, and like somebody else did it better by using that technique, that's pretty convincing, right? And so like it's kind of hard like I'm standing up in front of you saying, here's a bunch of techniques that I've I've used, and I've won some Kaggle competitions, and I've got some state-of-the-art results, but it's like that's kind of second-hand information by the time it hits you, right? So it's really great to yeah try things out, and and also like it's been kind of nice to see um, particularly I've noticed in the deep learning course quite a few of my students have you know I've said like this technique works really well and they've tried it and they've got into the top 10 of a Kaggle competition the next day and they're like Okay, that that counts as working really well. So so yeah Kaggle competitions are Helpful for lots and lots of reasons, but you know one of the best ways is what happens after it finishes and so definitely like for the ones that you've that are now finishing up make sure you you know watch the forums uh, see what people are sharing in terms of their solutions um, And you know if, if you want to learn more about them like don't feel free to ask The winners like hey, could you tell me more about this or that people are normally pretty pretty good about explaining um, And then ideally try and replicate it yourself Right and that can turn into a great blog post, you know or a great kernel is to be able to say 
okay, such and such said that they used this technique. Here's a really short explanation of what that technique is, um, and here's a little bit of code showing how it's implemented, and you know, here's the result showing you you can get the same result. That can be a really interesting write-up as well. Um, okay, so um, you know, it's it's always nice to kind of have your data reflect like I don't know, B is kind of easy to understand as possible. So in this case, the, the data that came from Kaggle used various, you know, integers for the holidays. Um, we can just use a Boolean of like, was it a holiday or not? Um, so like, just clean that up. Um, we've got quite a few different tables. We need to join them all together. Right? Um, I have a standard way of joining things together with pandas. Um, I just use the pandas merge function. Um, and specifically, I always do a left join. So who wants to tell me what a left join is? Since it's there, why don't you go ahead? So you retain all the rows in the left table, and you take so you have a key column. Hmm. You match that with the key column in the right side table, hmm. and you just uh, merge the rows that are also present in the right side table. Yeah, that's a great explanation. Good job. I don't have much to add to that. the The key reason that I always do a left join is um, that after I do the join, I always then check. If there were things in the right hand side that are now null, right? Because if so, it means that I, I, I missed some things. Um, I haven't shown it here, but I also check that the number of rows hasn't varied before and after. Um, if it has, that means that the right hand side table wasn't unique. Okay, so even when I'm sure something's true, I always also assume that I've screwed it up, um, so I always check. Um, so I can go ahead and merge the state names into the weather. Um, I can also, uh, if you look at the uh, Google Trends table, it's got this week range, which I need to turn into a date in order to join it. right? And so the nice thing about doing this in Pandas is that Pandas gives us access to you know, all of Python. right? And so, for example, inside the, the series object is a .str attribute that gives you access to all the string processing functions. Not just like cat gives you access to the categorical functions, dt gives you access to the datetime functions. So I can now split everything in that column. And it's really important to try and use these pandas functions because they, you know, they're going to be um, vectorized, accelerated through, you know, often through SIMD, at least through, you know, C code. Um, so that runs nice and quickly, right? Um, and then, you know, as per usual, let's add date metadata to our dates. Um, in the end, we're basically denormalizing all these tables. So we're going to put them all into one table. So in the Google Trend table, um, there was also um, they, were, they were mainly trends by state, but there was also trends for the whole of Germany. So we kind of put the Germany, on, you know, the, the whole of Germany ones into a separate data frame, so that we can join that. So we're going to have like Google Trend for this state and Google Trend for the whole of Germany. Um, and so now we can go ahead and start joining, both for the training set and for the test set, and then for ch both check that we don't have zeros. Um, my merge function. Um, I set the suffix if there are two columns that are the same I set the suffix on the left to be nothing at all So it doesn't screw around with the name and the right hand side to be underscore y and in this case I didn't want any of the duplicate ones. So I just went through and um, deleted them, okay um, And then we're gonna in a moment. We're gonna try to um, uh, create a competition, you know, the, the, the main competitor for this store has been open since some date, right? And so you can just use pandas to date time, passing in the year, the month, and the day, right? And so that's going to give us an error unless they all have years and months, so, so we're going to fill in the missing ones with a 1900 and a 1, okay? Uh, and then what we really know, we didn't want to know is like how long has this store been open for at the time of this particular record, All right? So we can just do a date subtract. Okay. Um, 
Now, if you think about it, sometimes the competition, you know, opened later than this particular row, so sometimes it's going to be negative, and it doesn't probably make sense to have negatives, meaning like it's going to open in X days time. Now, having said that, I would never put in something like this without first of all running a model with it in and without it in, right? Because like our assumptions about about the data very often turn out not to be true. Now in this case, I didn't invent any of these pre-processing steps. Um, I wrote all the code, but it's all based on the third place winner's GitHub repo, right? So um, knowing what it takes to get third place in the Kaggle competition, I'm pretty sure they would have checked every one of these pre-processing steps and made sure it actually improved their their validation set score. Okay. Um, so what we're going to be doing is um, creating a neural network where some of the inputs to it are continuous and some of them are categorical. And so what that means in the in the neural net that you know we have um, we're basically going to have you know this kind of initial weight matrix right and we're going to have uh, this this input feature vector right and so some of the inputs are just going to be plain continuous numbers like you know what's the maximum temperature here or what's the number of kilometers to the nearest store and some of them are going to be one hot encoded effectively right but we're not actually going to store it as one hot encoded we're actually going to store it as the index right and so the neural net model is going to need to know which of these columns should you should you basically create an embedding for which ones should you treat you know as if they were kind of one hot encoded and which ones should you just feed directly into the linear layer right and so um, we're going to tell the model when we get there which is which um, but we actually need to think ahead of time about like which ones do we want to treat as categorical and which ones are as continuous in particular um, things that we're going to treat it as categorical we don't want to create more categories than we need Right? And so let me show you what I mean. The, um, uh, the, the third place getters in this competition decided that the number of months that the competition was open was something that they were going to use as a categorical variable. Right? And so in order to avoid having more categories than they needed, they truncated it at 24 months. They said anything more than 24 months, I'll truncate to 24. So here are the unique values of competition months open, and it's all the numbers from 0 to 24. Right. So what that means is that there's going to be, you know, an embedding matrix that's going to have basically an embedding vector for things that aren't open yet, for things that are open a month, for things that are open two months, and so forth. Now, they absolutely could have done that as a continuous variable, right? They could have just had a number here, which is just a single number of how many months has it been open, and they could have treated it as continuous and fed it straight into the initial weight matrix. Um, what I found, though, and uh, obviously what these competitors found, is where possible, it's best to treat things as categorical variables. Right? Um, and the reason for that is that like, when you feed something through an embedding matrix, you basically mean, it means every level can be treated like totally differently. Right? And so, for example, in this case, whether something's been open for zero months or one month is like really different. Right? And so if you fed that in as a continuous variable, it would be kind of difficult for the neural net to try and find a functional form that kind of has that, that big difference. It's possible, because neural nets can do anything, right? but you're not making it easy for it. Where else, if you used an embedding, treated it as categorical, then it'll have a totally different vector for zero versus one. Right? So it seems like, um, particularly as long as you've got enough data, um, that that treating columns as categorical variables where possible is a better idea. 
And so I say when I say where possible, that kind of basically means like where the cardinality is not too high. You know, so if this was like um, um, you know the sales ID number that was like uniquely different on every row, you can't treat that as a categorical variable, right? Because uh, you know it would be a huge embedding matrix and everything only appears once. Or ditto for like kilometers away from the nearest store to two decimal places, you wouldn't make a categorical variable, right? Um, so that's kind of the that's kind of the rule of thumb um, that they both used in this competition. In fact, if we scroll down to their choices, here is how they did it, right? Their continuous variables were things that were genuinely continuous, like number of kilometers away to the competitor, the temperature stuff, right? The number, you know, the specific number in the Google Trend, right? Um, where else? Everything else, basically, they treated as categorical. Okay. Um, okay. So that's it for today. So um, yeah, next time we'll we'll finish this off. We'll see we'll see how to turn this into a neural network, um, and uh, yeah, kind of wrap things up. So um, see you then.